The following message is brought to you by the Ezra Institute for Contemporary Christianity and was recorded at Westminster Chapel in Toronto. To learn more about the Ezra Institute's mission to advance the Lordship of Christ, please visit www.ezrainstitute.ca. This week's reading is Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, 
Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads were not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's just pray as we come to God's word together. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you are a God who speaks and communicates and is in fellowship, in communion with us. Uh, Your word tells us that you have magnified your word above all thy name. And so we come to your word today, and as we come, open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have to say. Let the words of my mouth, Lord, and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we return to our series in Daniel this week. And to chapter 3, as we are dealing with one chapter a week, which means the readings are quite long. But it's actually good to hear uh, God's word read. In fact, as David reminded us on the first of these sermons on Daniel chapter 1, Daniel was written to be read and heard aloud because uh, the book wants us to, it conjures up for us uh, images that are meant to be heard. It's turning our ears into eyes. And actually, of all the chapters in Daniel, it's interesting that Daniel 3 is perhaps most important that we hear it read. You hear some of the repetitions, and you may have thought as the text was being read to us, this seems quite repetitious. The, the, uh, especially in the first half of the reading, all of the repetition that's going on, and actually um, there are um, scholars who look at the uh, literally the structure of the language and the linguistics there, and there's meant to be a certain amount of humor Uh, they think, in the way that there is this repetition of what the king is requiring and the pagan worship that is happening, because pagan worship was repetitious. It was meant to be boring, and the reiteration of it is meant to highlight that fact. So it's actually good that we hear the whole passage uh, read in this way. Now, last week we did a broad survey of the ideological and historical landscape in Daniel, and we looked at the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and God's interpretation of the dream that was given through Daniel. And in that dream, the king saw this great statue with a golden head and, remember, a feet of iron mixed with clay. And what we saw really last week was that in this uh, dream, in this uh, interpretation of this dream that's given to Nebuchadnezzar, it is God who is declaring himself to be in sovereign control of all of history. That was the overarching message. God is sovereign. He is in control. He is in charge. He gives meaning to history. And he is the one who was establishing these empires, a series of empires to serve his purposes in the lead up to the coming of the Messiah. And at that point, we heard that uh, the empire or commonwealth with each successive empire incorporating all of the others, would be struck at its feet 
And soon it would be carried away like dust in the wind in the uh, face of the reality of the rise of the fifth monarchy and the establishment of the kingdom of Christ with the accession, the ascension and session of the Lord Jesus. So this week we come now immediately after uh, the appointment of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in verse 49 of chapter 2 as rulers in the affairs of the province of Babylon to their refusal to participate in the worship of an image that the king sets up. Most children um, who have been to Sunday school will, of course, have heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's one that, uh, if you grew up in church, you'd have grown up with hearing, because it's dramatic, it's exciting, it's got fire in it, and people dying, and big statues, and confrontation, and so on. So uh, it's seen as an interesting story for children, but it's important that we hear it afresh, and we take in the implications and the lessons that apply to us uh, in the midst of it. So, let's think first about the embodiment of uh, this image. We don't know how much time has passed between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego becoming uh, senior officials in the province of Babylon and this event. The text doesn't tell us. One would imagine some time has passed possibly a few years, we don't know. But what we do see uh, immediately from this is that it's possible to reach right conclusions and yet not make the necessary deductions from them. It's possible to reach a right conclusion, Nebuchadnezzar reaches a right conclusion in chapter 2, but it appears he does not go on to make the necessary deductions from them. Think about uh, the financial crisis uh, that kind of came to a head in 2008. Uh, When everybody lies to everybody else in the financial markets, um, it's obviously the case that you are going to, you are heading for a disaster. And yet everybody, everybody seemed to be ignoring the fact for a very long period of time, just ignoring it, hoping it would go away, not coming to logical conclusions, logical deductions from an accepted reality. So, I use this as an illustration, banks knew what was going on, mortgage brokers knew what was going on, and yet the necessary deductions were not drawn. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is certainly in this sort of a situation. In the last chapter, we see that he was able to recognize the greatness of God, the power of the living God, by the dreams interpretation that was given by Daniel. He saw the rescue of meaning in history by God's decree. And he even went on, in recognition of this, to appoint Daniel and his three friends into the senior positions in the government of Babylon, to places of high authority. And yet somehow Nebuchadnezzar had not shaken off his religious assumptions about what I talked about last week, and if you didn't hear it, it would be a good idea to listen back to that message about this continuity of being that was common to the ancient world, that somehow the king, the head of state, represented a continuity with divinity. Now, there can be little doubt that Nebuchadnezzar has obviously got the idea for this image from Daniel's interpretation of the statue in his dream. This is where the idea, it appears, has come from. It's an echo and an embodiment of that dream. Just as he had been identified with the head of gold in the dream, so Daniel tells him that, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Just as he's been identified with that, he now makes an image overlaid with gold not just declaring the glory of Babylon, but his own glory and dominion. I mean, he's reasoning to himself, after all, I'm the golden leader that precedes the great monarchy, and I'm somehow in continuity with it. So the image was a symbol for him of his right to rule, his authority, his power, his continuity with the divine. And the text uses the phrase repeatedly that he had caused this image to stand. 
to stand. That is, he was, uh, he, he was establishing something here. He was setting something forth religiously, and he establishes a system of worship around it. And in so doing, he's obviously usurping the place of God. Now, it's true that Nebuchadnezzar has been forced to recognize that his empire is not going to be permanent. Yet, for now, he's seeing himself as God's agent. And again, it's true that God had given him power and glory, but it didn't mean that God was sharing his divinity or his kingdom with any human being. The king was not a continuation or an incarnation of God. So it appears that Nebuchadnezzar had understood Daniel's words and then placed his own kind of pagan spin on them, and we don't know how long it had taken him to get to this point, but it seems that he has concluded these things. Number one, his kingdom was a forerunner of the great kingdom that was coming. Number two, he had preeminence as the head of gold. Number three, he must therefore represent divine power and presence in that age. Number four, history had placed in his hands, history had been placed in his hands and derived meaning, in part at least, from him. And as such, if you resisted him, you resisted divine power. That appears to be what Nebuchadnezzar has reasoned through in this situation. And actually, all of these assumptions are a sort of partial truth, and that's what actually makes them dangerous. In terms of what Daniel has said, these are half-truths. He is a forerunner. He does have preeminence as the head of gold. He does, in a certain sense, represent God's authority. He is significant in history, and... When you resist authority, if it's godly authority, you are resisting God. So you've got partial truths built into these assumptions. But he's got this exaggerated view of himself. And uh, that comes out in the fact that he improves upon the image in the dream. Because in the image of the dream, only the head is made of gold. Or Nebuchadnezzar's image is completely overlaid with gold. It doesn't have iron feet mixed with clay it doesn't have clay feet at all and actually in this is reflected this perennial hope that we see throughout human history and it goes on today right through to the present a utopian hope of man's permanency the idea that you can arrest time and history and establish this sort of perfect socio-religious order now, I know it's difficult for, for, for us to get sometimes into this headspace, especially if we don't read political philosophy and some of the uh, cultural leaders even of the modern world, but this notion of utopia, of a kingdom that's established by man, even today's modern dream of an, an androgynous, differentiation-free, permanent social order, this, this is a, really a continuation of this basic idea. That man can create a, a, a world rule, a world culture, a world empire based on a certain set of religious ideas that are derived from him. And perhaps the king is even hoping that by instituting this worship, he can halt history in some way in this reign, his era of gold. It, it, either way you slice it, he's a usurper. Well, then what the text tells us is that worship is required of all the administrators and the representatives and leaders of the people from the various nations and languages. Now, this does not mean that everybody in the Babylonian Empire had to turn up to worship. What it means is that the leaders of the various and administrators of the various provinces throughout the empire had to come and gather as representatives of the people. They all had to appear at the plain of Dura for worship. Now, it may have been understood by the people as a worship of Nebuchadnezzar himself, as the appointed image of God on earth. The text doesn't explicitly say that. They may have thought that. At the very least, the image represents the religion of continuity of man with God. And so what was happening is that the king was seeing himself, at the very least, 
as the priestly leader of Babylonian worship. He was the priestly leader of Babylonian worship, and that was undermining and usurping the position that God had for the Jewish people in the Babylonian Empire. They were supposed to be the worship leaders in the kingdoms that God was causing to stand in this age. That's what they were there for. That's why God had allowed them to be carried there. And here you have, once again, a king, a head of state, trying to act as priest, trying to link divinity and humanity in himself. And so the image's significance actually resides in this distortion of worship. Nebuchadnezzar has made it. He's made the image. He's caused it to stand in his own power. He is the creator of this false worship. The fact that it centers actually on man and the worship of man is actually indicated to us in the measurements, in the dimensions of the image. It was six times 60 cubits. Six times 60 cubits. Now in the Bible, and there is a whole area of biblical theology that looks at the significance of numbers, but in the Bible, the number six is the number of man. Human beings, man is created on the sixth day. And I'm sure you're all familiar with, and we won't deal with the significance of the number now, the number 666 in the book of Revelation. It's the number of man. And the multiplication of the number six is Man enlarging himself beyond what he is. Six times 60 cubits. Man ascending to to divinity. So really what Nebuchadnezzar had constructed was a miniaturized holy mountain overlaid with gold. A counterfeit copy of of Mount Zion. It was probably an obelisk. It was a narrow, tall, stepped pyramid representing a kind of ladder. Talked about this briefly last week that ascended up to the gods. Man as the object of his own worship. And so again, what you actually have here is a distortion of a partial truth. Man is actually God's image bearer. One of the reasons why God's commandments, um, we have it here, the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Why does God not allow us to make a graven image? Why is it forbidden to make an image? Because God has already made an image of himself. And he guards that image-making project. And that image is human beings. Human beings are made in the image of God. So if you mess around with human beings and you manipulate them, you're actually creating a counterfeit God. You're making a false image. God has already made an image of himself. You can't make any other one. So there's a partial truth here. Man is God's image bearer, but he's not in continuity with God. So what's happening is that Nebuchadnezzar is still acting out of the basic worldview of the Chaldeans despite what he's recognized in part about God. For him, there's no separation of jurisdiction between priest and king, no church-state differentiation, no grasp of the independent but interdependent spheres that God has ordained. Rather, for the king, worship and religion are just departments of state, and he is the high priest. And actually, we're returning to this concept, frankly, in the modern age, as we abandon the gospel, the state starts to step in to take the place of God. So that's what the king does. That's what he sets up. That's the embodiment of the image. Well, what is the response of God's people? Well, we learn from the last verse of chapter 2 that Daniel is required to remain at the palace as head of the king's court, which is evidently why he is not found at the walled plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. That doesn't mean that Daniel is not being attacked here, though. Because Daniel's power and authority is being attacked in the form of his three friends, who he had recommended to the king be appointed as advisors and to positions of authority. 
So it was at Daniel's recommendation. Daniel made the request, verse 49, of the king, and he appointed them to these roles. So by coming after these three men, Daniel is being indirectly attacked in his position as well. Now, as administrators of that province, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are required to be present at this, as the provincial leaders are all gathering as representatives of the people to fall down and worship. The other leaders would have been drawn from all over the other provinces. What's the goal? Well, the goal is to unite the empire in terms of one state-sponsored liturgy. That's the idea of it. You bring everyone together, bring all the representatives together, and then you've got one state-sponsored religion, one state-sponsored act of worship. And it's supposed to act like a glue for the empire. That didn't mean that the local deities of the different peoples weren't tolerated. They were. But the king's idol had to be honored as the god of the empire as a whole. And this was the strategy of lots of the ancient empires. You, polytheism, worship of multiple gods in, by different peoples within an empire was perfectly acceptable so long as you honored the main god of the state, the gods that represented the state. And the king said that those who refuse are going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. It's in a context like this, isn't it, that you can understand psalms like Psalm 137 Verses 1 through 4. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. Notice the reference to music. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how shall we sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land? When the people came under this kind of pressure, this is when these songs are being composed. By the waters of Babylon we sat down and wept. It's often the case that believers are required to sing the Lord's songs in strange lands, in apostate cultures, where they're required to serve as prophets and priests among rebellious people, among ignorant people. And sometimes a nation is even handed over to the sons of Babylon and there the covenant people still have to serve God faithfully. So the context of the idol worship demanded by Nebuchadnezzar was a large open air temple complex. So it's helpful to get this image in your mind as well to understand what's taping, taking place. This plain of Dura is a walled plain. It's a walled plain. It's an imitation, it's a copy, if you like, of God's temple. And in the center, there's an image of gold. Not the Ark of the Covenant this time, but now this statue of gold. This obelisk. And then outside the center, but within the walls, is a blazing fire. Not the bronze altar from God's temple, which had a hollow center, but instead this fiery furnace. And just as the Levites, the Levites, the Levitical orchestra, would play the instruments prescribed by King David when the sacrifices were offered to worship the living God, so Nebuchadnezzar has his prescribed instruments play as the sing signal to worship his gods. And this image. Now in the temple, actually, music signified people being knit together in unity. That's the purpose of corporate singing. Actually, we see in Ephesians 5, 18 through 19 that the Holy Spirit is the one who helps the church produce music, who helps God's people produce music. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, being filled with the Spirit. When the spirit of a culture 
and gods of a culture changes, the music changes because music helps unite people. That's one of the reasons people go to clubs and dance all night to the music. Because music helps to unite people one way or another. It's very significant. Martin Luther is reputed to have said, quote, let others write the catechisms and the theology, but let me write the hymns. Few can discuss today the specifics of Martin Luther's theology, but many can sing, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. There's something about what we sing, and that's why singing matters. We are united by music in what we sing, in part because music is a corporate reality and singing is a social fact. So when we sing in church on a Sunday morning, we're not just, it's not just a prelude to the sermon. It's not just warming us up. It's actually an integral part of our worship and it helps just as the Lord's table helps unite us. It helps unite us in common cause, in common worship of God. That's why people sing at soccer matches and, and rugby and for rugby games because they're united in supporting their team. Now, I'm not saying that people have thought all of this through. They don't understand all of its significance, but that's what's going on. In fact, every major tournament, the England team gets a new song. And it's another song that you have to painfully forget after we fall out of yet another major tournament. Right? The song is supposed to unite. It's supposed to bring, and that's why we have national anthems. It's why it's a mark of patriotism to sing the national anthem, all the controversy you've got going in the U.S. All around those type of things because it's about unity, it's about identity. Well, this is what's taking place. You think about the 1960s revolution for a moment and how important music was as an expression of a changing religious vision. And the music of the 1960s united the young people of the time in that vision, or at least helped to unite them in that vision. This is one of the reasons why Christians need to reclaim music, because we were responsible for writing all of the best music anyway, and that's not a brag, that's just a fact. You look at Handel and Mozart and Beethoven and Bach and Mendelssohn, this music was written by Christians for the glory of God. What's happened to Christian music? Now, where you turn on some of these stations and it's like, it's bland, it's dull. Well, this is my opinion, and you're entitled to it. Anyway, the point is, is that vigorous singing of good songs on a Sunday is important because it helps bring God's people together. And we need to be thinking about how we as God's people recover music and arts and all of these different areas of life because of their significance. What is it we are called upon to bow down and worship in our own day when the music plays? Which idols are we asked to fall down to acknowledge? Do we fall down and worship a sexualized youth culture? I mean, that's what's worship today, isn't it? The idealization of youth and the sexuality of youth and the styles of youth. So you have to be tucked and pinned and pulled and adjusted to try and retain your youth. You're not allowed to grow up. You're not allowed to grow old. What about the music playing in the malls? Do we fall down and shop till we drop? Is consumerism our God? It's always accompanied by music as you're wandering around the store. That's another God of our culture. Do we surrender to the subversive cultural messages of the entertainment industry? 
all wrapped in music and creative allure in the various shows and movies? Do we kneel down to that androgynous image of man that it sets up today? It's destruction of all God's distinctions. It's undermining of God's order. It's subtle. And when the state and its political leaders issue their God-defying laws, do we fall down and cower to man's decrees and say, oh, well, you know, it must be okay then. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not willing to participate when the music played. Despite being government officials, they refused to join in. How many professing Christians who are in government roles today have that kind of courage? Far too many just keep their heads down. You would never know they were Christians at all. They say nothing. And I'm not going to reference particular names, but I know several professing evangelicals who are in church Sunday by Sunday, and I'm told by those that work in Ottawa, they never say anything. They're not spokespeople for the gospel. They're not spokespeople for God. Others actively participate in promoting and expanding ungodly, anti-Christian, even murderous policies. The slaughter of the unborn, the killing of the elderly, the stripping of the family of its rights, the destruction of marriage, the undermining of freedom of believers to speak the truth openly. Not Daniel and his friends, no. They wouldn't have been seen to be part of that. They publicly refused to participate in evil and idolatry despite being part of government. We often hear professing Christians early in their political career, early in their legal career, early in their academic career, saying and making the excuse that for now they're going to keep their heads down so that people can get to know them, and then when they get into a position of more authority and power and responsibility, then they will make their stand for God. And it never happens. The stand is never made. Because that was not the strategy of Daniel and his friends, was it? I mean, it's the opposite of the biblical strategy to get promotion. (laughs) The biblical strategy for promotion is faithfulness. From the moment they entered the royal college, Daniel and his friends stood for God and let their future be determined by God. It was by speaking for God, openly speaking truth to power and being ready to do so that they were promoted in God's providence to the positions of authority, even in a pagan context. But we don't believe God enough to believe that was possible now, do we? Once again, here they are, and now they're under great pressure again, worse pressure. And again, they stand for God. Their non-participation in what was going on might have been overlooked. It might have been overlooked. There's so many people involved in this public act of worship. The fact that three advisors of the parents of Babylon were not falling down in worship might easily have been overlooked. But uh, certain officials who are jealous of the Jews' promotion to preeminence in Babylonian affairs. They're probably still angry over the humiliation that they experienced with Daniel's interpretation of the dream that they couldn't interpret or reveal. I mean, you think about how humiliating that must have been for them. These Jews brought into the province the only one able to interpret and give guidance to Babylon, immediately promoted to very high offices, that must have been festering. And so they wanted to point out pretty quickly the non-participation of these men. But they were confident that God was able to deliver them. How much do we trust in God's ability to deliver us when we trust in Him, when we stand for Him? Not only this, but these, these men were so bound by their conscience and by their convictions to walk with God and to trust in Him that that even if God chose not to deliver, 
they said, we won't participate in your idolatry. We know our God's able, but you know what? Even if he chooses not to deliver us in this situation, so be it. We are not participating. We won't be part of that. They refuse to acknowledge Nebuchadnezzar as a priestly mediator or a being in continuity with the divine. They would not fall down and worship, whatever the consequences. And the reaction of the king is fury. And he actually poses a very critical question, doesn't he? What does he say? He says, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And as the priests of the living God, this is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Oof, that's poking the bear, isn't it? We have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. Now that is the response of a servant of God. That's what courage looks like. There they stood in this counterfeit walled temple. Here's the golden image. Here's the false altar, a burning furnace. And they're given the choice. You can go in there or you can fall down and worship. Oh, that as a church, as church leaders, as Christians, we would recover that kind of boldness. It's the sort of courage that the early church had in the first and second and third century. All too often if we're challenged in the least degree or intimidated or marginalized slightly, we're, we're silent, we cower, or we go with the crowd. Well, the king's fury at the apparent insolence of the Lord's servants here may have been in part due to the fact that he considered that it was the God of these Jews who had revealed to him that he was God's agent. Well, I'm the channel of God's revelation, and it was your people that revealed this to me, so what God is going to get you out of this, since even that God's on my side? I mean, that's what he's thinking. If he throws them into the furnace, who's going to deliver them? So Nebuchadnezzar has obviously misunderstood Daniel's explanation of the vision to an extent. He was appointed a servant at the beginning of this age of empire. God had given him power to rule, but that did not make him God's priest to guide and direct the worship of the people. He was not in continuity with God. He was not an incarnation of God's power and glory. And the Chaldean religion that saw the king as this mediator was obviously not yet broken in him. And this is actually a reminder to us that any state which tries to dictate worship, tries to dictate to the church, presumes to priesthood by attempting to rule the church, is in serious overreach of its prerogative. The modern humanistic state, not unlike the ancient pagan state, also permits its polytheism. Oh, you can worship, you know, whoever, whatever. The lesser powers in the name of the political policy of religious toleration. So long as the state and the court's power and glory is first recognized to drop the so-called dead letter of the supremacy of God that was even there in the charter, That's what the courts have called it, a dead letter. And acknowledge, therefore, the state's right to redefine life, truth, justice, marriage, human sexuality, and so forth. Yes, you can worship your God for now, provided you acknowledge all of these claims. There's actually only one God who can rescue us from these anthropocentric creeds of humanism and secularism with its state religion today, and that's the living God. Irrespective of whether he delivers us in our lifetime or not, 
either, irrespective of whether we see some of this legislation reversed in our lifetime, irrespective of whether we see the Canadian state acknowledge again the supremacy of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ as it once did, we will not bow to this implicitly religious priestly claim of the modern state to be able to redefine all of these things. For the modern state, any divinity there may be is essentially unknown. Oh yes, you're allowed to worship. But your God, or the various gods that we recognize, they're basically unknown. God has not spoken and revealed himself in Jesus Christ with any finality. We're not bound by God's revelation and his word in any of these things, no. The modern state, therefore, by definition, stands in today for this divine power, for the God who has spoken with authority and has already appointed only one mediator. Our queen did recognize that at her coronation. Formally, the Canadian state, therefore, recognizes it. It was formally kind of recognized in the charter. But it's not taken seriously anymore. Our God for them is an unknown being who has not spoken. If they believed that he had, they wouldn't proceed with the things that they're doing. But like Daniel and his friends, like the early church in Rome, we stand for faith in a radical discontinuity between the creator and the creature. They are distinct, and God alone can and has appointed a mediator between man and the divine whose authority is final, whose authority is total. That's why the Christian has to stand. That's why even the English Anglican, the English and Anglican John Stott could say something as bold as this. If the state forbids what God commands, or commands what God forbids, civil disobedience is a Christian duty. This is what's going on here with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If the state commands what God forbids, or forbids what God commands, civil disobedience is a Christian duty. Well, God intervenes, and that's where we bring this to its summation here. The three men are actually bound like a sacrifice. They're bound, like they are a sacrifice to the God, to be thrown into this counterfeit altar. Their official garments are still on. I don't know whether you noticed they're also wearing hats here. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I didn't particularly think of the ancient Babylonians wearing hats, but apparently some of the ancient Egyptians and the Babylonians did wear hats. Some were not unlike the bowler hats of the... Um, English period, the, the traditional English dress, apparently. Cane and a hat. Okay, this notion of primitive cultures reigning in the ancient world is, is mythical. They're bound, fully clothed in the garments of state. The fire is so hot that the men who cast them into the fire are killed by its heat. But then Nebuchadnezzar, to his astonishment, sees three men walking in the fire, unbound, and then a fourth who is like a son of the gods, or the King James Version renders it like the son of God. He sees a fourth. And they're walking around. Now obviously for us, as we read this in light of Christ and the gospel, we know this angel of the Lord here is the second person of the Godhead. It is the son of God. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Nebuchadnezzar had thought he was the son of God for this stage in history, but now he glimpses the true mediator, the son of the living God. Yes, he's God's appointed leader, Nebuchadnezzar is, but there's a greater son of God, the preeminent king of kings, and he's powerful enough to stop Nebuchadnezzar and to save his servants. That furnace that Nebuchadnezzar stokes and heats up seven times hotter than normal is a symbol of the expansion of the power and presence of Nebuchadnezzar. That's what it's about. 
But God converts it right here and now in this intervention into a symbol of his presence by walking with his servants in the midst of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar thinks it's about his power and presence and the son of the living God walks in the midst of the fire and turns it into a place where the presence of the living God is found. By stoking it, then Nebuchadnezzar had actually only killed his own people. So he intends to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by stoking his fire. His mighty men go there, three of them, and they are killed by Nebuchadnezzar's fire. But then when it's converted into the presence of God, manifesting God's presence, his people are saved. See what's going on here. The false religion of Nebuchadnezzar kills people, but the true faith in the living God saves and delivers. Now with that incredible incident, Nebuchadnezzar begins to understand a bit more than he had before. This is evident by what he says to them. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. That expression there, servants of the Most High God or God Most High, is actually the the Gentile name for the living God in the Old Testament. This is clearly the king beginning to become aware of God's transcendence. He's not yet got a full understanding still. That comes later. But he's beginning to get a better grasp that this is the transcendent God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of gods, God most high. And when these men come out, only their bonds have been burned away. Now that's significant. Their official garments, their robes of their garments of state are intact Now that indicates, I think, quite clearly that God wanted his servants to continue holding high office in Babylon. God could have burned off those robes and given them something else. But they emerge still in the robes of the state, in their official robes. Only the bonds have been cut, burned away. And then Nebuchadnezzar proclaims the uniqueness of the God of the Jews. He says, for no other God has ever effected such a deliverance. No other God's been capable of this. And so he praises God and he recognizes the exclusivism that God insists on regarding worship. And actually he notes, very importantly here, the discontinuity between himself and God. How? Because he recognizes that his command has been set aside by the living God. That's discontinuity. You see, the ancient kings thought, I'm in continuity with the divine. My command, my order is an order of the divine. It's an order of God himself. Here, he suddenly recognizes this discontinuity. The king's command has been set aside by God Most High. He thus saw that to challenge the exclusivism of the worship of God Most High could not be done without danger to himself and his empire. So he proclaims a royal decree forbidding any misrepresentation or criticism of Yahweh. The God of the Jews, God Most High. Well, let's wrap that up with this. The Jews now, still living in Jerusalem, would have heard about this deliverance, this mighty deliverance in Babylon. And so they would have known now that God was active in Babylon setting up true religion. This is what God is doing. He's challenging all the powers. He's setting up true faith in Babylon. In fact, God was now setting up Nebuchadnezzar as a wall of protection around them and a wall of protection around the worship of Yahweh. You could not now assault and attack the God of Yahweh in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar's decree. That's a wall of protection around the Jews. And God can actually continue to provide us even in a difficult time for the church in the West, a wall of protection, should he so desire. I think he has already been gracious to the church in the West and given us a wall of protection. 
Daniel and his three friends had already been made political rulers. They were already prophets in Babylon. They already had set aside and pushed aside the prophets of paganism. Now they are promoted again in verse 30 to being religious leaders in Babylon. Now they're priests. Now they're allowed to guide worship because they said, we're not doing this. Prophets and priests. The Chaldean and their religion had been defeated first as prophets Now they're being defeated in Daniel 3 as priests. And Daniel 3 establishes that God was going to be with his people in exile. Now it wasn't just a case that, oh, we've got Daniel and his three friends. They'll protect us. Now the people knew with assurance God was going to protect his people in exile. He was going to walk with them even in the midst of the fire of trials and tribulations and difficulties. He'd be there. And so for the faithful, the exile, as I mentioned last week, was not a step back. For God's faithful people, it wasn't a step back. It was a step forward into new opportunities as God was making a new world and preparing and instituting a new covenant. He's preparing for the new covenant age, internationalizing the religion of the Jews. What was coming would be larger and greater and a manifestation of God's grace and power and holiness beyond anything that had gone before. And now today, we as God's people this morning, we are living in the days of the King. We're the ones who have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We're the ones who worship the resurrected Lord and Messiah. How much more should we expect That even in a time of exile in our own land, a time of marginalization and ostracism and to a degree persecution, how much more should we expect that God will be with us and manifest his power and glory through us if we are faithful? And one of the greatest manifestations that Jesus Christ is amongst us is right here at the table. This is where he stands amongst us and we participate in his life. So let's come to the Lord's table now. Thank you for listening to this message brought to you by the Ezra Institute for Contemporary Christianity. Please feel free to share it with friends, but do not charge for or alter the material in any way without the express written consent of the EICC. Thank you, EC. 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 Thank you. Thank you.